Welcome everybody. Welcome to Berghead Free Church. Welcome to the, to the. Uh, yeah. Usually, usually about this time we're we're silent because for about three minutes. <laughs> Keith. <laughs> Keith. I know. <laughs> well, this is good. The the uh, the fellowship and everything is is very good. So welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to Berghead Free Church. Our evening service, uh, combined service of Berghead and Elgin Free Church. I'm, of course, Brian, one of the ministers here. And you should have received one of these service sheets on your way in that will have everything you need to participate in our worship. And for our call to worship, our call to worship is from Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Praise the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. What an appropriate thing to finish out our Lord's day, to come into the Lord's presence with singing. What better way than to, than to sing Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. So please, uh, if you're able, stand with us and we'll sing Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. Gavin now to come and Gavin will lead us in prayer after which Sue will um, will read our scripture passage after Gavin leads us in prayer. Let's come to God in prayer. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found was blind, but now I see. Lord, we are indeed amazed that you, the almighty creator God, who holds the universe in his hands, would have love and compassion for a people who live in a world full of sin and that have turned their backs on you. 
We thank you for all that you've done for us and the blessings you've shown on us, clothes to wear, food to eat, homes, families, friends, and even our very breath. Yet when we compare the glory of your creation to the fallenness of our broken world, we cannot help but ask, what is mankind that you're mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them? Father, we all deserve to be punished for rejecting you and going our own way. But even before we fell, you had plans to lift us up. By your love and mercy, you have given us the gracious gift of your Son, our Lord and Saviour, who died in our place to take the punishment we so deserved. We praise and thank you that as far as east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Father, there are so many times that we fall short of your glory. We do things our own way that we know are against your will, and we don't do things that we know would honour you. Forgive us, we pray. Restore our hearts and renew our spirits that we may once again be able to come into a closer relationship with you. Father, we confess to you all our sins that cause us to take our eyes off you and distance us from your presence. We praise and thank you for your promise that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. In a world of sin and brokenness, we find it hard knowing how and for what to pray for. Lord, at this time, we pray for all those affected by conflict, famine, or natural disasters, for those suffering, whether physically or mentally, and for those bereaved or displaced. May they be comforted by your presence and come to know the hope and peace that can only be found in knowing you. Lord, we particularly remember all conflicts that are happening across our world at this time, and pray that you would flood the nations with your grace and mercy, bringing all leaders and people to fear your name, and to experience your salvation. Bless the leaders of this nation, Father, as a new government has been formed. We pray for wisdom and judgment in all future decisions made. We pray that godly men and women would be raised up, whose voices would be heard and advice sought as they strive to do your will. Father, we pray for the justice for the marginalised and those who face persecution, especially among your people. Set them free from oppression and indifference. Help this world to realise what is wrong and what is right and provide peace and hope for those facing injustice. Show them that you are their refuge and strength and ever-present help in times of trouble. Give us hearts full of compassion, Lord, and a boldness to stand up to injustice in your name. Lord, we pray for the lost, for a world that doesn't know or refuses to recognise you. Show yourself to those who don't believe. Allow us to be a source of light to those who need you. We pray for all those we come into contact with who don't yet know you, our families, friends, our neighbours, work colleagues. And we ask that you would give us the courage and divine opportunities to make Jesus known to them by our words and deeds. Lord, we pray for those who are struggling, whether it be in body, mind or spirit, in health or circumstance. God of all comfort, we ask that you draw near to them and their families and meet them where their need is greatest. Reassure them with your presence and if it's your will, lay your healing hand on them and restore them to full health. Finally, Father, we pray for our congregations here at Birkhead and at Elgin and thank you for the privilege of being able to meet together to hear and study your word. We pray that the summer break will be a time of rest, refreshment and closeness to you. We particularly pray for Peter and the family and ask you would bless their time away. And now, Lord, we ask your blessing on the remainder of the service as we sing your praise and read your word. Bless Paul as he opens up your word to us and fill our minds with the wisdom of your scriptures. May your Holy Spirit touch and convict each of our hearts tonight. We pray all these things in your will and in the precious and holy name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. We'll now join together in the Lord's Prayer, which is printed on the sheets and on the screen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours.
now and forever. Amen. The Bible reading is Psalm 60, which can be found on page 578 in the Pew Bibles. Psalm 60, 578. For the director of music, to the tune of the Lily of the Covenant, a miktam of David, for teaching. When he fought Aram Naharam and Aram Zobah, and when Joab returned and struck down 12,000 Edomites in the Valley of Salt. <coughs> you have rejected us, God, and burst upon us. You have been angry. Now restore us. You have shaken the land and torn it open. Mend its fractures, for it is quaking. You have shown your people desperate times. You have given us wine that makes us stagger. But for those who fear you, you have raised a banner to be unfurled against the bow, the bow, the bow. Save us and help us with your right hand, that those you love may be delivered. God has spoken from his sanctuary. In triumph, I will parcel out Shechem and measure off the valley of Succoth. Gilead is mine. And Manasseh is mine, Ephraim is my helmet, Judah is my scepter, Moab is my washbasin, on Edom I toss my sandal, over Philistia I shout in triumph. Who will bring me to the fortified city? Who will lead me to Edom? Is it not you, God, who have now rejected us and no longer go out with our armies? Give us aid against the enemy, for human help is worthless. With God, we shall gain the victory, and he will trample down our enemies. This is the word of the Lord. So we've had the privilege of hearing God's word, and before Paul comes and preaches to us, let's stand together and we'll sing a metrical psalm for, for Psalm 60. Please stand. You, O oh God, have overthrown us and have cast us clean away. You have dealt with us in anger. Now restore us, Lord, we pray. Welcome from me as well this evening. It's good to be here and it's good to see you here. Um, there must have been times in your life when things hadn't worked out quite as you planned. Uh, even for the little ones over on the side here, I'm sure that's the case. Sometimes things just don't work out. I'm sure I'm not alone. My last job um, before retiring was as head teacher, as a principal of a primary school. It was a Church of England primary school. Uh, it was in the east end of Sheffield. 
And uh, despite it being a Church of England school, 334 of our 340 pupils were Muslims. And uh, now the, the, law, the law says that every single day in England, uh, we have to have a collective act of worship every day. And the law also says that those assemblies, as we called them, should be broadly Christian in character. But the law, someone once said something quite pertinent about the law, didn't they, which I'm not going to repeat here, but the law also gave parents the right to opt their children out of attending those assemblies. So you can imagine, with all those Muslims and me running a daily Christian assembly, many, many of the parents said, we don't want our children in there. And so I used to give the assembly to a smattering of children across the hall, while the rest were all being looked after by teachers who didn't want to be looking after them. That was their few moments of peace in the day. So I set about trying to change their attitude, the attitude of the parents. Um, we planned a series of invitational assemblies for the parents to come to. And we sent home detailed plans of what the terms assembly arrangements would look like, what the program would be. Um, and we held discussion meetings with the parents for them to see how important those meetings were for whole school ethos and unity. I say parents, it was actually uh, all mothers virtually who attended the meetings. But to my great delight, across five or six weeks, that was all it took, we had all the children coming to the assembly, every single one of them. Great victory. But I hadn't consulted with the local imam. And uh, it was short-sighted and foolish, to say the least. One morning, he came to see me, and he told me the children would stop attending the assemblies with immediate effect. Uh, there was no debate, no compromise. It was over. And I was devastated. Uh, I'd made mistakes. I'd failed. I was miserable. And I dwelt on that failure for a long time. I'm sure you've been there. So what to do? Well, in Psalm 60, David, historic king of Israel, he seems to be facing failure. Now, the background of this psalm, it can be found in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 8 and 1 Chronicles 18. And it's interesting to note in both those accounts and in the introduction to this psalm now, the, that short introduction before the psalm starts, um, in that description, we, what we read is nothing about failure it's about victory in fact um it's about a, a glorious victory really do you see that at the end of the introductory description there it says when joab returned and struck down twelve thousand edomites in the valley of salt what a victory and yet when we look at the detail of the psalm it seems to have been written at a point of desperate need. Look at verse 3, for example. You've shown your people desperate times. Verse 5, save us and help us with your right hand. Verse 11, give us aid against the enemy. In 2 Samuel and 1 Chronicles 18, it seems David's army is crushing all before them. He defeats the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Philistines, Amalek, we're told the Lord gave David victory wherever he went. But when you read the full history, it turns out David has actually overreached himself. While he's up in the far northeast, did I get this right up there? While he's up in the far northeast, seizing territories near the Euphrates River, he's left the capital city down south exposed. And the Edomites seize the opportunity to attack where he is weak. And this psalm seems to be written at a point where he realizes the foolishness of his actions. And things seem to be unraveling before him in this moment of failure. And he seems to sense God's rejection. Do you see that in verse 1? You have rejected us, God. 
and burst upon us. You have been angry. Now restore us. We read about God's rejection in many places in the Bible. There can be lots of different, sometimes complex reasons for it. But in this case, I think the Bible is simply saying that in God's world, foolish actions have foolish consequences. So adultery can destroy marriages. It can cause children to suffer. Addiction to drugs can lead to a life of deceit and criminality. Anger can cause frustration and resentment at home, at work. And David goes on this unnecessary raid up in the north, carried away by his successes, and no wonder he gets attacked down in the south. You see, my lack of proper thought, forethought when planning a way to get those children into the assembly it led to an even more entrenched opposition from families and from the Muslim community. We ended up in a worse place than we had been previously. And when we think of those kinds of consequences, then these words in verse 2 and 3 seem appropriate. You have shaken the land and torn it open. Mend its fractures, for it is quaking. You've shown your people desperate times. You've given us wine that makes us stagger. It's a picture of brokenness and desperation and confusion in the midst of failure. Now, of course, look, failure isn't always the result of foolishness. Sometimes we fail for reasons that are completely beyond our control. A cafe opens in the village and COVID hits. Suddenly everything's lost. We're in a new job, uh, or in a job, where new management changes the focus or changes direction, and the skills we bring, they're no longer relevant. There are lots of reasons why we fail, and things can just happen. But that's not what this psalm is addressing. Have you ever been in a moment like the one David is facing? Because perhaps because of pride. When you know you've acted foolishly and the consequences are just unraveling before your eyes, foolish actions have foolish consequences. Well, if ever you've faced a situation like that or you know people who have, these words are so precious. Just, just look at verse four. But for those who fear you, you have raised a banner to be unfurled against the bow. Think of those, sorry kids, this, you won't be able to think of these, think, but some of the adults here, think of those movies uh, from the 60s, like El Cid. Anybody remember El Cid? One or two do. Uh, they're on, no, oh, you're too young. They're on this epic battle. I think it was Charlton Heston. You probably never heard of Charlton Heston. <laughs> so they're on this epic <laughs> battlefield. It's all roaring and screaming, dead and dying bodies everywhere. And one side is losing heavily, El Cid's side, losing heavily. And you can see the hopeless despair on all the extras' faces. And then suddenly, a standard is raised, a, a flag. It's a banner on a wooden stake, and it's driven into the ground. And a horn or a trumpet is sounded. And the beleaguered, depleted army of El Cid run to the flag. It's the place where they regroup for safety before they go out and attack again. It's the place to run for safety. And David's place of safety in this psalm is the promises of God. And as we read through the rest of the psalm, those promises are outlined so that we know where to run to when we find ourselves in this kind of situation. And the first promise is that God works despite our failure. I'm sorry you don't have headings on your sheet. This is what happens in the summer when everybody goes off. Um, but the first heading, there's a little space there. Um, God works despite our failure. Take a look at verse 6. God has spoken from his sanctuary. In triumph, I will parcel out Shechem and measure off the valley of Sukkoth. God is saying here, Whatever mistakes David has made, they won't interfere with God's plan. Our failure is not his failure. God will complete his purposes. 
He has spoken from his sanctuary. It means he's spoken in holiness out of his mighty power and authority. And then he says he'll parcel out Shechem in triumph. The Shechem Valley was a strategic piece of land, the principal highway for merchants and travelers moving between northern and southern um, Israel. And God says he's going to wrap it up like a gift, securing it so that his people east of the Jordan are accounted for and safe. And then in verses 7 and 8, he declares his sovereignty over the whole of the promised land. Gilead, he says, is mine. That's in the east. Manasseh is mine, that's in the west. Ephraim is my helmet, which is to the north. And Judah is my scepter in the south. He says all of these places are his. As a child, you know, I, I, used to, I, I bet some of you did this as well. I used to ponder over an atlas of the world um, and marvel at all the pink bits that represented the British Empire. Did you ever do that? All these pink bits, I thought we were great. And... Uh, it's true, yeah. Well, David, he might look at a map and he might want to highlight the areas he thought he controlled. But God says, remember, David, all of this land belongs to me and I'm in control of keeping them safe. And more than that, in verse 8, even your enemies, Moab, Edom, and Philistia, are just my servants and I'll use them to do whatever I want to do with my lands. Moab is my wash basin. I do in it what I please. On Edom, I toss my sandal. I treat them with disdain, using them for my own purposes. They are simply my servants, using them for my own purposes. They'll do what I command. And when it's all over, it's God that will get the glory. Even over Philistia, uh, God says, in the end, it will be me who shouts in triumph. It's me who wins the battle. So the message for us is we must remember who God is in the face of failure. Those of you here who have young children and those who remember having young children, you may recall times, usually close to bedtime, when you ask one of your children to clear away their playthings and they start, sometimes reluctantly, uh, but they have a go. But gradually, they're tired, they're getting fretful. It all becomes too much for them. And they just can't get the lid back on that toy box. And there are too many Lego pieces for me to properly sort out. And anyway, I don't know the right order or where they go. Anyway, it's not fair, because I can't do it on my own. And eventually, you go in and say, it's all right, it's okay. I'll help you sort it. It'll only take a little while, don't worry. I'm not going to leave the job unfinished. I'll pick up the pieces and make sure the job gets done. And that's what the Lord is saying here. Do you see? At the end of the day, no matter what happens, remember who I am. Your failure is not my failure. I will complete my plans. So, God works despite our failure. And so back in my school, if God wanted some of those Muslim families to come to know Jesus, he'll take care of that. Even my foolishness can't mess up God's plans. Which is not to say that it doesn't matter what we do. Brian touched on this this morning. Uh, it's not to say that we can naively go along with our um, selfish plans and God will do the work anyway. I'm sure David wouldn't want to encourage that kind of attitude. Right at the end of verse 1, he says, restore us. And I don't think he's just talking about his battle plans and his military situation. I think he's speaking spiritually. Restore my relationship with you, he says. And in verse 4, he says, for those who fear you, those who honor you, you've raised a banner. In other words, when we find that plans have failed because of our foolishness, when we can be confident that God works despite our failure, which is an encouragement. God works despite our failure. Now, maybe you're sitting there thinking, well, okay, that is an encouragement, but, well, it's a relief to know I can't really put a spanner in the works of God's eternal plan. But nonetheless, when I mess up... Um, through my foolishness, I mean, I look at the situation I'm in, 
it's still a mess. And we can feel beyond help, weighed down by guilt and frustration. And we might think, I'm not useful for anything anymore. I'm a great fan of the American author uh, John Irving's novels. If you're on a good holiday read, get a copy of his book, A Prayer for Owen Meany. Terrific book. It's kind of got a, it's delightful and it has a Christian tone. I hesitate to say there's a Christian message, but it, it's well worth a read. Um, and one of the many themes that run throughout all his works uh, is the notion that we all have a deep-seated need to be useful in some way. Um, and if or ever we lose that sense of being useful, well, life spirals downhill rapidly. His characters begin to fade away, miserable and hopeless. Now, we're all different. But I personally feel that need to be useful really keenly. And David too says, welcome to my world. Just look at verse 9. He feels hopeless for the task and he says, who will bring me to the fortified city? Who will lead me to Edom? As David writes this psalm, the battle is raging in Edom. As I said earlier, he's up in the north and the Edomites are attacking in the south. There are no jet planes or tanks even to get him down there. He can only do it on foot. So he can't get there to respond. Edom feels completely impenetrable for him. And he feels helpless, useless. He's cut off from the fortified city. He feels cut off from God. Verse 10, is it not you, God? You who have now rejected us and no longer go out with our armies. And it's all the result of his pride and foolishness. And don't we sometimes have that same sense of being cut off from our sanctuary with God? That our, our sin and our foolishness has put us on a collision course with our creator. That our turning from him. At those times when I said, I, I know better than you, God. I can sort this out myself. And so we fear we alienate the only one who can help. Well, the second point that should be on your sheets there but isn't is God saves despite our failure. God saves despite our failure. In other words, even after a royal mess up, we can be delivered. Take a look at verse 5. David cries out for salvation from his enemies. Save us. And help us with your right hand that those you love may be delivered. And again in verse 11, give us aid against the enemy for human help is worthless. Human salvation is useless. David knows his failure is the result of his foolish pride of saying, I'll do it my way. And so he does the only thing he can do. He cries out to God and says, I need your help. And the war that's raging in Edom, that's not really the main issue. The military conflict, it, it's just a picture in the psalm of the war that rages on the inside. Not just of David's heart, but of every heart, including yours, including mine. Of our failure to listen to God at times, not to go God's way, but instead go our way. And therefore, to be facing his ultimate displeasure. In verse 12, we come face to face with the relentless goodness of God. With God, we shall gain the victory, and he will trample down our enemies. God can bring victory in the midst of our sin and failure. Just over 2,000 years ago now, there was another piece of wood that was driven down into the ground, and on top of that piece of wood wasn't a banner, it was the broken body of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who took the punishment for the sins that we've committed, the punishment that we deserved to take. In those epic movies, the righteous armies can be facing seemingly certain defeat. It all looks over for them. And then the banner is raised, they regroup, and the tide turns. And it would be all over for us too if it were not for the body of Jesus held high on the cross. We can't know what God will choose to do with those situations where we mess up because of our failure. But we know 
that because Jesus takes the punishment we deserve, and because he rose again from the grave, therefore he wins that battle for us against sin and death. So the cross is not a place of fear, but a place of victory. And what does this mean for us today? As we move through this life, we will experience times when we feel failure, failure of our own making. We'll certainly meet with others who mess up. And it's very easy to point the finger and attach blame. It's tempting to succumb to gossip. So how do we handle those situations? How do we counsel others in a godly way? Well, it would be good to remember the wisdom of this psalm, that God can work despite our failure and that God can forgive us despite our failure. Do you know, back in my school, when the imam came to my office with his demands, I was so distressed, so disappointed, so defeated. I was so grateful to my chair of governors when I met him afterwards. Uh, Martin is now a bishop down in Leicester in England. He simply said, Paul, it's all in God's hands, not yours. Jesus died for those Muslim families, and God has a plan for them. I was bothered about my failure. I was bothered I'd let the children down, let him down, let God down. Convinced myself I was useless. But Martin redirected my focus back onto Jesus. Jesus had everything under control, as he always does have, always will have. He will always take away fear from those who love him. So be encouraged. At times of failure, or when we feel rejected by God, remember that at the cross in Christ, our God reminds his people who feel rejected that they are in fact his beloved. Praise and thanks to God for his gracious and loving son. Amen. Well, let's give praise and thanks, shall we? As we sing together a great song of commitment in times of plenty, uh, in times that are lean, blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful. Do stand if you're able and join with the song. Blessed be your name.
say a final prayer do stay for tea and coffee you know that peter's gone to north carolina and uh, i don't know whether they, well, i can call them doppelgangers i probably can't but uh, the family over on the side those are that's it's your house he's living in and they're living in peter's house so uh, perhaps you'd like to have a chat and uh, tell the young lad who i don't know their names yet because i only said hello just before he started there's a, an, a lionel messi supporter there and um, I'm sure he'll be a Jude Bellingham supporter by the end of the night. Uh, we'll see. But sorry, let me, it's all nonsense. Let me pray. Um, now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Do take a seat.